interview with Agnes Heller, conducted by Claudia Stevens on August. Let me switch this microphone. Now. This is an interview with Agnes Heller, conducted by Claudia Stevens in Blacksburg, Virginia, on August 4th, 2003, for the Holocaust Museum of Virginia, Richmond, Virginia. Mrs. Heller, could you please start out by stating your name and place of birth? My name is Agnes, middle initial S for Sekely, my maiden name, Heller, and I was born in Budapest, Hungary. And uh, how old are you now? Oh my, you should have done this a year, about a week ago. I just turned 70. My birthday is July 16th. I was born in 1933. And how many languages do you speak? I speak German, Hungarian. I understand some French and some Spanish. I'm fluent in German and Hungarian and English. Do you feel that English is the language you're most comfortable with? Yes. Okay. And we're going to begin by talking about the period before the Holocaust began. And can you tell us where you were then living and describe your, your town and uh, as much as you can remember about the particulars of your of your mm -hmm. life at that time? Well, as you realize, I was pretty young. I was 10 years old when the Germans invaded Hungary. Um, prior to, we lived in Budapest on the second floor of a town apartment in a very nice neighborhood. And um, there was a gymnastic school on the floor below us, and I would always go for classes there. Um, my father was quite a prominent attorney, and he had his office in the same apartment. One wing of the apartment was his office, and uh, we generally had a lot of fun, carefree, carefree people. So you lived in Budapest and not uh, in another town? It was in the middle of Budapest, yes. Do you remember the street that it was on? Yes. It was um, Holland Utsa Kilans. That the street is Holland, translated into English, number nine. And was that in central Budapest or one of the districts? It's parallel to the Danube um, part, and it's um, maybe one block from the St. Stephen's um, Kurut, you know, Budapest has these rings going round and round in the middle and downtown section, and this is about one block from the Kurut. It's quite modern, nice neighborhood. So your memories are essentially happy of that period? Yes, I didn't have any reason not to be. Were you in school? Yes, yes. I so went to the school. I went to the Evangelikus. The uh, I guess that's translated evan evangelic. I don't know how you translate it. What the equivalent? Not really, because that sort of describes um, maybe what the Baptists are in this country. No, I would think it was it was more. Um, a church school, but um, except for the fact that they did have classes for um, Christians, it was really uh, non-sectarian. And I had a lot of friends in that school, some of them Jewish friends, mm -hmm. yeah. So there were Jewish and non-Jewish children all together? Yes, yes. And did you have religious instruction at that time? Uh, Excuse me? Did you have religious uh, instruction too? In well, it must have been that we had it, but, and we were probably excused from it, but frankly, I don't remember. I just don't remember that too well. I don't remember anything good about it, if there was, or anything bad about it. But you were a little girl at the time. Yes. And so you, 
study typical subjects in that school? Yes, mathematics, languages, Latin, geometry I didn't have, but I had algebra, I was quite advanced. And sports as well? I don't recall if we had any sports. I was a good gymnast. I know I went to gymnastics class all the time as a private instruction for me, and I skated, but I don't remember that we had outdoor activities at all in the school. And with your family, do you remember taking trips uh, in the countryside or doing particular things that you enjoyed having to do with travel or, or the outdoors? Well, you know, in those days, I think middle class and well-to-do families left their children at home with maids and servants, and I had a German Fräulein uh, who took care of me and my sister. Only traveling I remember having done was to go summers to my grandparents' place in Jönjus, which is a small town about 80 kilometers northeast from Budapest. So this was a family home in, uh, before your, your family came to Budapest? Had they lived in that town? My mother grew up there. Yes, my father uh, was from Dürer, which is a fairly large town between Budapest and Vienna. And I really didn't know his family very well. I knew maybe one or two of his siblings. I, we were very close with my mother's family. And so you have memories of going to the, the grandparents' home yes. there in, in, in the yes. small town? Mm -hmm. I understand that they, they also had vineyards there. Yes. Can you tell about that? Well, my grandfather, from what I understand from stories, had been a rag merchant at one time and um, couldn't make enough of a living. And he started buying up land with a friend of his and to learn about growing grapes. And his friend got a little scared about a venture that he really wasn't acquainted with from his own family background. And my grandfather just went ahead, bought him out, and kept increasing his holdings. He became one of the largest wine merchants and vintners of that county and was very well known. He, uh, the whole family was actually in the business except for one uncle. And um, he had prize-winning white wines that he exhibited at the Paris Fair. Now, this is mostly hearsay, of course. When you were a child, did you uh, go through the vineyards? Did you have a chance to, to see the, the operation? In yes, the or in, not wanting to jump ahead, but one of my favorite times was when Jews could not go to school anymore. Then I was down there at my grandparents' place. It was September, which is the harvest of the grapes. And I was allowed to go to the vineyards, and in fact, I was allowed to hold the horses and ride back with the wagon and then go into the winemaking part of the house, which was in the back in a separate building, and uh, tread the grapes. So I do remember very well those times. So a happy period of time. Yes. And this was um, during the period uh, before 1944, we're talking about. Well, this must have been, I suppose, very close to 1944. I guess 1943, September. I don't really remember when it was that we weren't allowed to go to school anymore. That's why I'm asking. Yeah, because must have been before because the Nazi era really started. The Germans came March 19, 1944, and after that, we went had other things to do. Yes. But before the Nazis actually came, there was also a period during which there were restrictions against the yes. Jews in place. Do you remember any, anything of that touching you personally or that you saw? This is the only thing I recall, really. <laughs> OK. Do you remember, you mentioned that you had friends who were not Jewish um, and that you came from a prosperous family. What, did you have any experiences of anti-Semitism from that time at all that you recall as, as, no, as a No, I really don't recall any of that. 
happening at all. Most of my friends, I think, were Jewish in the school, but we did have other members in the class who were not Jewish. Was, was Judaism part of your life as a girl, or were you assimilated to a considerable degree? Well, I really did not have a Jewish education. My mother's father, my grandparents in Jewish were very devout, and my grandfather, in fact, for many years was um, president of his synagogue. He helped build the, rebuild the temple after a tremendous fire that took place in the town many years prior. But my parents did not practice going to temple, no. Were you affiliated with the congregation? In the not that I recall at all. So no. you don't remember going on high holidays? We did not. Like So there was no religious sense that you had associated with being a Jew at that time? No, nothing. We'll move ahead now to the period when the Nazis, when the Germans came. And can you tell us, you've already told us when that occurred in March of 1944, and um, you were then at that time how old? Well, I was still 10, ten. because my birthday was in July. Yes. And where were you living at that time? Still in Budapest? The very same street. Yes. And at that time, do you remember any sudden occurrences? Or just describe in your own words what happened? What well, I had, been, happened? I had been to the beauty parlor for the first time of my life. As I later discovered, it couldn't have been on the very day that the Nazis came because that was a Sunday. I found that out recently. But I remember that we were in the beauty parlor and the planes roared into our capital. And of course, everything stopped. They sent me home. I couldn't have my very first hairdo finished. And um, that's the most memorable thing about that very day. And Did you know it was happening? Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. We knew. Were, were well, people, people talked about it, you know. Were they panicking? Was there a sense of panic? Well, I can't safely say that I remember that part. But uh, they did send me home. And um, after that, uh, my parents did a lot of planning as to what they should be doing. Tell about that. Well, my father, having been so well known, had a lot of friends among the uh, lawyers, and I suspect it was eventually, I suspect it was Dr. Halmy who saved my life out, that told him about the fact that he was on the shortlist for deportation among the attorneys of the town. Why was there a shortlist, and how did your father's name get there, do you think? Well, anybody who was a prominent person was supposed to have been um, sent away so that they couldn't practice their profession. And um, I don't think it was anything that he had done except that he was Jewish. And um, we heard about it from a friend. And what happened was that um, this friend recommended that since he always had ulcers and was never very well with his um, digestion, that he should check into a hospital and maybe avoid being sent away, and that is exactly what he did. And um, the crisis, this particular crisis, then passed. And um, shortly after, people had to start wearing the yellow stars. Our house was declared a safe house. By whom? Uh, by Raoul Wallenberg. It became a Swedish protection home. And do you think that that was for a particular reason, because of your father's connections? Oh, no, no. It was, or they randomly picked houses. So it was random? Yes. We did not have papers from the Swedish consulate. I know my parents debated whether we should get any, in which case we could stay in the apartment. If we didn't get papers, to protect us, we had to move. But they decided that um, my father was a pretty smart man, and he decided that this wouldn't 
protect us enough. And he decided we should go into hiding. Would you excuse me? I have to get a sip of water. Yes. <laughs> My mouth is so dry. Oh, it's, it's very interesting stuff. I just, you know, tell whatever you want to tell. This is okay. okay. All right. Can we go on? All right. So do you have any recollection of seeing German invading forces or Hungarian sympathetic forces mm -hmm. to the Nazis coming into your neighborhood or into your home or having any encounter with your family at that point? I don't think I ever did. Don't forget, this was probably as early as April, and things were pretty open and not anything very drastic was happening except wearing the Jewish star. I mean, we could go about the, our lives, I suppose, as well as possible. Probably there were curfews, but I don't recall anything of the type you're asking. Were any friends of the family uh, being moved into the ghetto at that point, or did you, did you hear about occurrences that mm -hmm. affected neighbors or, or family, friends, or relatives? Well, we, we did, about that time, we did find out that some of the relatives in the country were being uh, deported or sent to ghettos first and then deported, and there were relatives in the outskirts of Budapest who had been taken to the ghetto. The ghetto in Budapest? Or yes, yeah, the ghetto in Budapest, which is very near the Dohányutsa Temple, the biggest um, synagogue in Budapest. Some of my distant relatives on my mother's side were there. And others who were in the country, did you hear rumors or anything factual about them being taken to camps at that point in 1944? Well, I, I did later, in my search for information among my mother's papers, I did later find a letter that my grandfather wrote to my mother being very concerned about the the future and, and about the prospect of being deported. Unfortunately, I have searched high and low. I just cannot find this letter. I know I saved it. But uh, I didn't know at the time. My parents didn't really discuss any of this with us. Do you think that they were aware that deportation meant being sent to a concentration camp, to, uh, to a death camp? Was I, that in their consciousness? Uh, I doubt that very much because um, in retrospect, I heard stories about the fact that since my grandfather was such a very well-known, respected, and loved person, and my grandmother too, that um, the head um, helper in the vineyards was offering to hide him and anybody that he wished in the family, and he's always came back with a comment that he's a good person. And God would not let him be hurt. At that time, do you remember, because things were becoming difficult, do you remember there being scarcity of essential essential things, food or clothing or heat at, at this particular time. You were still in your own home. Mm -hmm. I don't remember any hardships, honestly. And, you know, my father had arranged for us to go into hiding. Um, if you'd like, I could elaborate on that. Yes, um, I never knew the people that he took us, took me to. I didn't know where he or my sister were going. I was on an estate in the um, Buddha part of Budapest, a very big estate, and the gamekeeper's um, house is where I was with other children. And um, I was there essentially for a summer holiday. Uh, my father had um, always thought that I was a very good student in mathematics. He gave me a million, well, quite a few problems to solve, so I shouldn't be bored while I'm there. 
and essentially we just played all summer and had fun. I had no idea where they were. I had no idea where my sister was until um, one evening when I couldn't sleep very well, I went to the kitchen for milk and found my parents there in the middle of the night. It turned out that there was a big pantry where um, they were hiding during the day because there were other kids there and it wasn't something that the gamekeeper wanted to advertise that he had adults there too, I suppose. He must have had like a little camp there for children. And my parents were in that pantry during the day. There was a coat rack kind of wall that they pushed there during the day and then rolled away at night. And they happened to have come out that evening. How long had they been there? Well, they must have been there probably, like me, from April or maybe beginning of May until I discovered them sometime, I guess it was end of August. So they were there all that time and you didn't even know it? No, I had no idea. But your, your father thought this was essential in order to survive, to, mm. to hide in that way? Yes. He, he considered it the most important thing. And I don't remember if we ever had any papers. I really don't. So what were the conditions like then? other than the fact that your parents were hiding in the pantry and you were doing math problems. The um, conditions on the estate, yes. they were very nice. It, a lot of greenery and a lot of uh, outdoor activity. I don't remember having any bad feelings about being there. But the interesting thing to me, and having gone over this whole story a couple of times recently, I cannot even remember their name. I don't remember their faces. I think that there is a photograph in my mom's uh, album. My mother's passed away, so I can't ask her, but I think that that is them from very, very far back in my mind. I think that that one picture is them, but I, I do not recollect. It's, it's not, I wasn't close to them, let's put it that way, or else I would know. But there was no imminent danger that you could feel or? or no not until uh, Horty was deposed. And uh, when that happened and the Arrow Cross Party became powerful in Budapest, it was sometime in September, um, they gave us exactly 24 hours to get out. Now how was this issued? By a radio or uh, how, how, or your, uh, how did people know that, that this that the situation had changed in such a manner. I only know it from now, having read history books. At the time, all I knew is we had to leave. Yes. And um, there were there were, I think, incidents of of the Arrow Cross Party coming on the grounds and poking around, things like that. But my father uh, had decided right away that uh, he had to go to find me and themselves some other place where he could be hiding. And he left um, during the day and then did not come back until very, very late at night. There had been some air raids and we had absolutely no idea if he even was alive. He arrived somewhere in the middle of the night telling us that he had to walk over quite a long distance to get back because the bridges were, some of the bridges were bombed and that he found that the wonderful family, his very good friend who was a Gentile attorney, was very ready to have me come and stay with them. And um, they took me there the next day, and that was Dula and Louise Halmy who eventually saved my life. Let's have a look at their photographs. Okay. Time. It's, we're recording. It's oh. We're, we're, we're fine. I can change the picture because I'll just zoom in. And mm. I just got too sentimental earlier. I'm sorry. I try That's not right. to. And, uh, this this is Louise Halmy, 
And this is Jula Harmi. He is a very well, was a very well-known attorney in Budapest. And these pictures are from the year 1950. On a Christmas no, uh, note to my mother, I found them. Um, the reason I went to search for it is because I, as you well know, had recommended them for an award of the righteous to Yad Vashem. And they had asked me for photographs from the war, at which I really had to laugh. Who had time or effort or energy or interest to take pictures? <laughs> but anyway, as close to the war, 1950 photographs. Both of them have deceased by now. So you came to live in their home? Yes. And where was that located? Um, it was on this Elizabeth um, ring, uh, not near to where we had lived, but right across from the St. Stephen's Basilica, the biggest church in, in Budapest. Um, the name of the street, Bajci Zilinski Ut, Tizenkilens A. I still remember that. And how, under what circumstances, were you able to live with them and be protected from danger? Well, they treated me as a relative from the country. They told people in the building that I just came to spend time with them because it was a little bit um, better for me. They didn't say anything about me being in hiding at all, and I went about daily things, daily chores. So you had no papers to prove you I, were another person? I don't think I had any papers. I don't recall any papers, especially since there were, was an incident, if you would like to hear about that, um, that proved that I had a lot of nerve going without papers. Um, Louise was baking a cake, and she had no sugar in the house, not enough for her, what she was doing. She had the ration cards, but she couldn't leave everything in the middle of the kitchen, so she sent me to the store. Most of the time I went with them everywhere, but I went down to the store by myself, and there were very long lines as usual. And I had heard that there were some women, young women, who would put pillows into their dresses so that they would look pregnant and get waited on very quickly. But of course, I was only 10 years old, so that wasn't a good option for me. And I just stood in line with the SS soldiers, right among them, not saying a word, got waited on very quickly, and got home with the sugar. And um, Louise was furious with me, but you know, she said, how could you do such a thing? I would never trust you again. Well, I told her that I spoke fluent German, and I thought if anybody was going to question me, I would just say I belonged with them, that's all. I would speak German to them. So that was one of the things that I did, and of course after that they never let me out of their sight, except one more occasion when they had to go somewhere and I was home alone. Um, that was rather dramatic because the SS came to um, their apartment and banged on the door and rang the bell and I was scared to death being home alone by myself. I climbed under the linens in the bed and I thought I would pretend to be asleep because it sounded like they were going to break down the entire door. Eventually they went away and they came back the next day. And it turned out, uh, I remembered that this old man had been at um, Halmi Jula's apartment, who was also having an office right there in his apartment, as well as an official office somewhere else. And this old man had been there a couple of days earlier, and apparently um, the Halmis gave uh, this Jewish client of theirs some money, and the uh, SS had captured him and beat it out of him that he got the money from the home. So they came to um, give him a little bit of a problem by questioning him. And hopefully, uh, we, we were hoping they wouldn't do anything to him. And they didn't. 
Um, the homies were fairly devout Catholics. They took me to church with them too a couple of times. And um, how did you feel about that? About going I didn't. To religious service with them? I don't think I had any bad feelings about it. I just went naturally with them everywhere they took me. They had a lot of love for me, and I felt very secure. But at any rate, uh, the end of it was that the, the SS went away, and they did not bother them at all after that. How long did you stay with the homies in their home? And what was going on with other members of your family, mm -hmm. as you now know, during that period? Well, I, I came to them in September. And in January, we were liberated. But in, in um, December, actually Christmas Eve, there was a bombing and that hit the building. In fact, their apartment was almost completely demolished. And we had to move down to the bunker. And at that time, they were pretty worried about me being so close with other people in the building and maybe having them question me about things. Um, I think maybe uh, they had already told me at that time, but I certainly know now, that my sister was hiding with another family, um, just a man and his wife, they didn't have children, and that they took m my parents in at the time we had to leave the estate in September. Did you know that your parents were safe while you were with the homies? Did you have any way of communicating no, with them? No, I did not have any word from them until maybe February or so, when it was a little safer to come out and walk the streets again. Do you remember being worried for, for the safety of other family members then? Probably. I, I don't think I had extreme uh, anguish. I think the fact that the homies said that they were all right was enough. <clears throat> I don't know if they had any, I don't think they could have had any communication because any time you looked out on the street or you saw, and in these days you certainly saw a lot of soldiers with guns pushing people around, kicking them, and um, being abusive. So it was better for them to stay where they were rather than worry about me. And I suppose they were not worried about me at all because I was well taken care of. They knew the, I had not known the homies before. So I, I, I never saw them before. Were you aware that you were passing as a non-Jew? And did this create any kind of stress for you or a, awareness of? Um, I think, I think I was at the time. I think I was. Um, my father, in fact, suggested at one time that we take catechism classes. And um, I remember that he bought me a necklace with a cross on it, too. I think I wore that. And did you feel that that was sufficient, or did you feel that you had to change your behavior or your appearance in other ways? I don't, I, I'm not asking if you felt you looked Jewish, but some people did you know, feel very conscious of having a particular Jewish appearance and this made them nervous and so on. Well, you know, when I think back on it, I don't think I knew anything about this uh, or worried anything about it. The fact that I didn't have very, very um, strict religious training, except in school. I mean, I knew I was Jewish and I didn't go to the Christian religion classes. But other than that, it didn't, hit my life much, whether I was Jewish or not. So that when you were posing as a non-Jew, this didn't seem like a, a particularly big stretch for you? I don't know if I would use the word posing. The question never came up. The fact that I wore a cross is the only thing, I suppose. But other people who came to see the homies or neighbors? Never asked me a question. I'm not sure that they ever entertained. They may have had some family member come and visit but I honestly do not remember them having people in or going much for visits. They were not the kind of times when people did a lot of socializing. I'm going to go now to the, the period of the liberation, if you like, of Budapest and uh, how you then left the Hamis and were able to recontact your family members. Mm -hmm. Can you tell about that? 
Well, my parents came to them, um, I think it was around the middle of February, but I don't think they took me back with them yet. It wasn't so very safe. Um, there were still a lot of um, dead horses in the street that people were carving up for food. They themselves didn't think there was anything to eat, and they didn't ask them to release me to their care until sometime in March, I think, uh, when we could get back into our original apartment, which was also bombed. There was only uh, one room and a kitchen available. The rest was in shambles. And so that's when we reunited. They picked me up and I went back to, to them. I don't recall it being traumatic or anything. and. We just said so long we didn't say goodbye to each other. The homies and us stayed friends and we visited often even since that time. And when you went back into your own apartment with your, with your parents and your sister, what were the conditions like then and did you try and find other family members and mm -hmm. learn about their fate? Well, my parents told me that my sister un didn't fare as well as I did while we were in hiding. She had um, walked away from the people that she lived with and got lost, and they found her starving and eating um, cigarette butts off the street. And that um, that was unfortunate, but otherwise she was okay and came also to live with us then. We had nothing to eat except the um, preserves that my mom had put away in the pantry. And I remember having the most unbelievable amount of um, melons and fruits that she still had there that nobody else wanted. We were dining and breakfasting on that for many days. Then my father decided um, to go and gather some wood from the Daniel uh, banks so that we could have some heat because there was of course not nothing to heat with and also to go to the country where my grandparents had lived because rumor had it that the people in the country stashed away some food and that he would purchase some of that so he did that um, which was also dangerous because people got shot for very small um, provocation, you know, if you had two or three watches, the Russian soldiers who came uh, to liberate us were not always very kind and they would shoot people if they didn't surrender their watches promptly enough. So we were worried about him, but he did go to Djendjus and he found the uh, helpers and the uh, uh, people my grandfather was associated with who told us that they had all been taken away. And um, they knew that my um, grandparents and my granduncle and my mother's sister and her husband all were taken to Auschwitz. My mother's two brothers were in forced labor camp. This much we knew. But uh, we had no idea if anyone was coming back. Can you now show some photographs of yes. these members of the family sure. where you have them with you? And uh, perhaps describe uh, the, what happened to people that, that you're going sure. to show to us. Sure. Well, the picture that I like an awful lot of my grandparents is this one. I, I don't know how well it will come out. It's very, very poor in its original to begin with. But um, this is my grandmother, and this is my grandfather, and this was my grandfather's brother. Now, my grandfather's brother lived in the same building as my grandparents in Jundjus, and I'll show you the building um, right now, which has since been declared a national treasure because it was designed and built by a very famous architect called Medjosoy. 
and my grandfather and his family lived on this side, and my granduncle lived in a small apartment on this side. I don't want to digress too much, but this became the uh, headquarters for the Nazis during the occupation. Then it was the headquarters of the Russians, and is currently an ear, nose, and throat hospital. Now, my great uncle, who lived in this apartment, never allowed another person into his apartment who was my age except me. I was his darling. And was this the building that, that the, 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 uh, the winemaking was associated with? Yes, it was. It, it was. The, uh, my husband and I had gone back there um, after the Russian uh, communists left Budapest in 89. We happened to have been living in Vienna and we took a trip after December when it, they got liberated and we went back to the building and um, the caskets, um, I'm sorry, I always make this mistake, the casks, the wine casks are still there in the cellar. They're built in, they're floor to ceiling so they cannot be removed. One of the buildings in the back where the a yard, uh, well, they don't call it a yard, Udvar, it's a, it's a big enclosure really, the house is, goes around the block, where the winemaking equipment was, is being used for machinery. Um, and, um, oh, I had this upside down, didn't I? And um, most of the building is not the way <coughs> it was originally planned. Um, the, the stone is still there, but the beautification is gone. They had frescoes between the windows, hand-painted frescoes. They had a very beautiful stone balustrade that went around the building that got all taken away, and um, hand-carved um, wood ceilings, they're all gone. They, they plastered over them, but they consider it still um, National Monument. I, th I found that very interesting. You know, after they ruined half of it, you see, then it became a national. Now the grandparents and the great uncle then were deported? Yes, from there. And um, this was my uncle, who my mother's brother, who was in forced labor camp, and he came back eventually. This is his son, who was eight years old at the time, and his wife, who both died in Auschwitz. They lived in the same town, but he did not live in this building. He had another house of his own. He was the only one in the family who wasn't a winemaker. Do uh, you know what happened to your grandparents and your great uncle, where they were taken? Well, my grandmother had diabetes from the time that I knew her. She was the world's most wonderful cook. She never tasted any of her pastries. But she, I understand, had died in the cattle car. I think he was probably sent to the gas chamber. He was, my grandfather was a little bit more uh, healthy. Now my um, cousin and his mother were also gassed. The people on the bottom. Okay, this is my aunt and uncle, her husband, who were in Auschwitz. They came back but I'm, I'll probably have to tell you how we found out that she was back. And this is my other uncle. He also came back from forced labor camp. Um, my aunt. Um, so anyway, this, this my father found out, since you asked me, when he went to Djendjus. And he came back with all these sad tales. We knew nothing about these, this brother or the father of my uh, little cousin because they were in forced labor camp and we heard nothing and we knew nothing about my aunt's aunt and her husband. So one day um, someone rang the bell in Budapest at, your apartment. at our apartment and uh, a lady in rags and very, very uh, emaciated skin and bones asked to come in. And my mother opened the door and said that she would be happy to give her whatever we had, but we did not have a whole lot ourselves. And uh, did she need any money? And she started crying. 
because it was my mother's sister. And she had not recognized her own sister? Yeah. And so the sister had been... The sister was told by the Red Cross that we all perished. And she did not believe it, so she came to the apartment. And that's how we found her. And then slowly she found out that her husband returned and that the two brothers returned. But um, the biggest amazement in my life is how this woman, my aunt, who was very close to me, we were like, really, she was my second mother in a way, how she was able to survive this whole terrible experience because um, she herself had diabetes. It may be that she developed that afterwards, I'm not sure. But um, she was very much uh, spoiled, you know. She was the youngest in the family. She was four foot 11 and never had to do much hard work. And <clears throat> the details she was uh, asked to do in Auschwitz was in a, in a stone quarry where she had to carry the heavy stones back to wherever they commanded her to take them. So. She survived that, and both she and her husband had never gotten rid of the uh, markings in their forearm. And they were at Auschwitz for several months? Oh, yes, yes. Well, I don't know exactly when they were deported, but, you know, she came back, I suppose it was April of 44. It was, you know, Hungarian Jews fared a little better than Jews of other countries because they did not deport people quite as far back in the, in the number of years were less, so I suppose we have to be grateful for that. And so then in all of the immediate family, how many family members would you say were lost to the camps, to forced labor well, camps and so on? Well, five in my mother's family, her parents, her sister-in-law and nephew, and my great uncle. Oh, well, and then uh, there, was, there were several other uncles of hers, but I don't think they had um, all perished. There was a cousin of my mother's who was um, on my grandfather's side. A, bro a, a sister of hers had a son who was shot into the Danube. He was a um, champion chess player, and they hauled him out of a chess tournament and shot him. And I think he must have been about 30 years old in Budapest. And my father's side, they all died. Uh, I, all his brothers and his sisters died in, in the camps. Yeah. How many brothers were there on your father, of, your brother, of your father? <sighs> on my father's side, he had... Um, two brothers. One brother escaped to Paris, but we found out from the Holocaust Museum that he was deported from there, and I assume he passed uh, on to. And he had um, two sisters. Now one sister, his youngest sister, committed suicide just as about the time the Germans came, and the older sister was also taken away. My father is the only one who survived from his family. They had no children. It's amazing, you know, if I think about it, how few people in the family had children. My one uncle, you know, he lost his eight-year-old, but he never had any kids after that. And my aunt never had children. So. Now let's move on to the period where the the Russians, the communists have taken Hungary, and um, life was not necessarily easy then either for you, I'm assuming, and can you tell about a little of that and how it was that you made your way to America? Well, like I told you, my father had a lot of foresight about how to plan his future. He was very smart and um, he loved America. He actually had been in the United States prior to the war trying to arrange for passage for his family and for visas. My mother did not want to leave with two small children and her family 
back home. She was very close to them. And after the war, my father was in America again to try to make uh, our way to America s smooth when I contracted polio. And I was supposed to leave for, this was in 1946, I think, yeah. And I was supposed to leave for England to boarding school that year. And of course, having gotten ill, the whole thing got postponed. And by the time 47 came around, things were really bad. And when the first Russian uh, inscription was put on a Hungarian monument of Kossuth Lajos, who was the most famous Hungarian hero, he said, we're leaving. And so um, not having had uh, been permitted to say goodbye to anybody, we just packed our bags. He actually got his furniture and his belongings out because of the type of visa we had. I really don't know how he arranged that because they had um, a two-story building size van or, or um, sea voyage carton to load things into. And I'm, maybe he told people he was going to have a smaller place to live in. How they wouldn't know that that was going abroad, I don't know. But we were not allowed to say goodbye to anybody because he was afraid that someone would tell the police and they wouldn't let us leave. And so we came in 1948, November, or end of October, I think, because I remember it was Halloween and I couldn't believe that this rich America has beggars in the street. <laughs> <laughs> and where did you come initially, to New York? New York, yes. My father had gotten an um, affidavit from another lawyer friend who was Hungarian, and that's how we came. And tell how that started, what, what life was like for you in America. I'm assuming you spoke some English. Oh, yeah, I was fluent in English and German and Hungarian. Actually, I learned German before I learned Hungarian. When did you learn English? Why? When? When? I think my father just had us uh, take English lessons. Maybe it wasn't until after the war, but I think it must have been quite early on in 45, because I spoke, I spoke British, not American English. So when we came here and I started school, I had a lot of trouble understanding some of the idioms, like you are nuts, that threw me when the kids would say things like that. <laughs> Wasn't it a culture shock for you? Would a you shock? Culture shock. Oh, I enjoyed myself. I don't think I had a problem with anything except that my parents were pretty strict. I couldn't wear lipstick, even though all the girls did. And having had polio, uh, and still I wasn't 100%. I should have gone for a lot more physical therapy, they told me, at, which I discontinued much too early. We had a hard life. My father, having been an attorney, his law um, knowledge was totally useless because you have a different um, law here, different um, uh, legal system. And he became a salesman for insurance. And my mother, on the other hand, had uh, become uh, the owner of a very well going cooking school. Here is her picture. She started out just making cakes for a famous caterer in 57th Street, which I delivered prior to going to school what sort of cakes at five in the morning. Tell us about the cakes. Well, they're right here on this picture. I also have an article. She was in the New York Times. Craig Claiborne used to review her work. She was fantastic. She could do things that I never could duplicate. I mean, I can cook and bake, but nothing like what she did. She had a diploma. It's called Inyansmester. I really don't know how to translate that. But it was a diploma from Gerbo, the most famous um, Hungarian bakery. And my father, I believe, 
had had an idea that she better have something in her background that was other than going through a couple of years of finishing school like the girls in those days. And um, so he prepared for the eventuality that she would have to do this. And so she baked cakes in the morning, then I delivered them to the uh, Manhattan. We lived in Jackson Heights at the time. We, um, I delivered them to this uh, de uh, delicatessen, Old Denmark, I think was the <coughs> name. And um, then I went out to school to Jack, well, first I went to school at Julia Richmond in, in Manhattan, which was sort of a sister school to Hunter College. And um, then I had gone back to Jackson Heights and I had the job selling clothes and then I studied at night and this went on and on and on and on and on. And you met your husband in New York? Well, this at the time that I did all this, I hadn't known him yet. Uh, I was still in high school. My father, meanwhile, had gone on to um, study law at the Brooklyn Law School. He just wasn't happy not being a lawyer and was also a Freemason. And on, uh, after I graduated high school, I was then already in City College of New York for the first year when there was a dance at his Freemason's Lodge and um, Hungarian Freemason, and that's where I met my husband. He came with his parents and I came with my parents. And you were at that time how old? When I met him was uh, 54, so I was 19, yeah. And were you already in I'm college? sorry, 52. I was 19, but I said the wrong age. Were you already about to enter college? Or I, I skipped college? high school. I skipped a year in high school. I was so advanced in Latin and in mathematics that I finished at the age of um, 17. And I, I, that was my second year in college when I met my husband. Yeah. Now I'm going to move on because I know that uh, you obtained several degrees in I think in engineering and in mathematics? Well, I first had a degree in business administration, but I, um, under the influence of my husband, took a lot of extra math classes. And when I graduated, that's when we got married in 1954. We married in August. I graduated in June of that year. And I believe a few months before that, I got my citizenship. He he encouraged me to go on for an advanced degree. And um, I worked for a couple of years first, but um, decided I would try the graduate degree. And so I went into Columbia Graduate School and I got a master's degree in mathematical statistics and had two children at the same time. So here was impossibly hard work yet again. Do you feel that the experiences you had during the war and the aftermath of the war, do you feel that these helped to make you stronger and more able to confront the challenges of, of being a student and mm -hmm. a mother and being in a new country and all of these things? It must have. It must have. I think we grew up a lot faster. We weren't coddled or protected that much. Um, and. Um, Actually, I should have, at that time already, done something about trying to get an award for the homies who saved me. I was going to get to that Yeah. by way of asking when you began to look back. Because when mm -hmm. you were doing so many new things, mm -hmm. and getting educated, mm -hmm. having children, moving into professions, um, this was a time, a, a very busy mm -hmm. time for you. Mm -hmm. Were you looking back or thinking back or talking about things then, or when did that begin to happen? Well, it's very interesting that you asked me that. I became a much more observant Jew because my husband and his family were so. And um, I never 
I never fasted on Yom Kippur before, but I did once we met. And I don't know if I really looked back on those days at all very much because somehow they were painful. Um, when we lived in New York, we didn't belong to a temple that we only did once we moved down to, to this area. But um, I think every time I heard German spoken, I had goosebumps on my back. I, I, and um, I didn't dwell on the past much, I don't think. I was too busy. So um, when we moved down to, to um, this area, I had several um, opportunities for, for a career job. And um, when we lived in um, Roanoke at the time, they, I worked for Babcock Wilcox in Lynchburg. They sent me to Germany several times on a business trip. And my older boy said, Mom, I can't believe you went. And I told him, you know, after all these years, you just have to give a little bit and not feel so passionate about disliking people for what they had done. Um, did you feel that it was the Germans or that it was just particular Germans? Well, it's interesting. The younger Germans, I didn't have any problem with interacting with them or anything. The, the professor, uh, not professor, the manager who invited me to work with them for three months, uh, and eventually then after that for a whole year, we went there, <clears throat> my husband took sabbatical, we lived there a whole year. I didn't have any problem with the younger people, but his parents who were, you know, in their 70s at the time. This was uh, in 1972. I couldn't feel comfortable with. And then sometimes the Austrian people we met who were wonderful to us, you know, would come out with comments, which they still believe, that, oh, we did not welcome Hitler, which you know very well from history is a big lie, that he forced us to to be on their side. The Hungarians, um, to this day, I don't really feel any empathy. I like the music, I like the food. We went several times to visit the most, the very first time in 64 when we cried our hearts out because we never knew if we'd see our relatives again. They were still under communism. Um, we went a lot, but now most of them are gone. My husband still has relatives. I don't. So we don't go that often. And um, I suppose deep down I will never feel that it was my home. America is my home. But nevertheless, you went to some effort to have the homies recognized for what they did. Yes, of course. Yes. And tell about that now, and we'll get a chance to see uh, we'll get a chance to see uh, some documentation from, okay. from that. Why don't we take a two-minute break? Yes. Questions I, I should ask, too, although I phrase them in my own way, really. But um, tell me when we're ready to roll, Jody. I hurt my face too much, I know. <laughs> no? We are rolling. Mrs. Heller, when you started to talk about your experience that you had gone through in Hungary and what the Homies had done for your family, at what point were you in your own life when, when you began to look back and to tell others? Well, in 1964, we went to visit the Homies. I told you it was a fairly momentous visit. And then in 1972, we went and the two children were with us then, our two boys. Uh, but Miss Dr. Holmey had passed away by then. And I never really thought to um, review all the things that happened. And frankly, to tell you the truth, when I think about it, until I started the application for them to become righteous among nations, I hardly ever could talk about these things. Um, and I didn't start that until the year 2000 at someone's suggestion. Um, 
someone at the Holocaust Museum suggested it. And after I got into it more and, and um, developed um, a review of all the things that happened, I felt that the best thing I can do with my life is let other people know how they were wonderful people like the Homies, who very unselfishly, without ever accepting one penny for their good act, had gone on to save people. Because the people we stayed with on the estate, I know got paid plenty by my father. They still turned us out. The lady who they then later lived with, who kept my sister and my parents eventually, I think also got some remuneration. Homies never, they never accepted anything. I only remember my mother opening her jewel case afterwards and asking Louise to pick out something and she picked the bracelet and that was it. They would never accept anything. They were wonderful. And I think the fact that they had no children made such a big difference to them that I was their little girl. And so in uh, 2000, I put in the application to um, Yad Vashem at the suggestion of the archivist at the Holocaust Museum in Washington. And um, heard nothing for two years. Well, actually, at the time of the application, they kept telling me, you need to know when they were born, you need to know where they were born, you need to know maiden names, you need to know mother's names. Well, my head was swirling, I knew nothing. So, and they weren't alive anymore. So I turned uh, to the Hungarian Red Cross, who were absolutely fantastic. They turned over uh, documents, they, they wrote to the, the authorities in several towns. Mrs. Halmy, Louise, was from the same town as my father. As I found out uh, later on, she knew my father's whole family. So that was one link to them. And then, you know, he was my, my father's colleague. But I still could not unearth every information. I only knew the pertinent things. And for two years after handing in the documents, I heard nothing. And we had been away for the um, end of uh, December holiday season to California to visit people. And when we came back, there was a letter and an email that they had gotten the award of the righteous. And it really touched me. I, I cried. Um, it was very, very moving thought that I was able to get this for them. And as you know, we went to the ceremony in March um, of this year. They had a ceremony where they received the award. This was a ceremony taking place in? In Budapest. The uh, Israeli ambassador had invited us to the ceremony and um, they get a certificate like this in English and in Hebrew. And then there is another uh, piece of document here, which of course, if we had found relatives of theirs, they could have kept. But all these are being kept in the Yad Vashem uh, Museum in uh, Israel. They will not release anything to me or to anybody else but a living relative. There were um, 18 people who were honored on that uh, day, and um, this little booklet was uh, at that time presented to everybody. It gives the story of every person, all of the 17 people who got the award, how they saved the people. It gives the name of the person they saved and a little synopsis. Um, they didn't give the names of all the people that were saved, like one particular person saved 100 Jews, you know, they didn't list all of those. And then if they did have, uh, and, and, and my story was also read, and if they would have had descendants that we had found, they would have gotten 
these two documents to keep for themselves and honor them. It was really beautiful. And um, I'm glad we had gone. I understand there's a poem. Well, let me. Yeah, let me tell you. Um, after we were notified that this would take place in Budapest, this honoring their um, heroism, we decided to go to the ceremony because uh, my husband thought that even though we had not found any relatives that very um, week or the months before, maybe we'll find some um, still. And he was sure that if I don't go and don't buy my ticket early enough that we would miss out. I'm sorry, but I, I need to find the poem right now for you. Here it is. And so what we did do is to buy our ticket and um, I searched for more information among my documentation. I knew someone had written to me that Halmi Luisi had passed away. And we didn't know what town this letter came from. Again, I didn't save the piece of paper so the Red Cross couldn't track them down. In the end, we did find out that she had two sisters, both of whom passed away. And one of the sisters who was married was actually buried by the other sister. So we knew that if that sister who was married had had children, they would have been at least recorded in the, in the books of the town, you know, so there was no hope for relatives. We called everybody who had the same name as her maiden name and Halmy name, and I called them in Los Angeles, in Washington, in New York, no, no luck. But I also lived through all my papers. And lo and behold, two weeks before we go into the ceremony in March, I happened on this lovely inscription. I had a little book into which people wrote things when I was um, still in Hungary. Uh, from 1945 on, people wrote little remembrances. And this is the um, note that the homies wrote to me after I left their home. Um, this is from Louise. It just says that um, I don't wish uh, anything more for you except that you should love me as much as I love you. And this other one is a little story which this real serious lawyer, Dr. Harmi, wrote to me. And I will read it to you since you asked. I will read it in Hungarian. And then I will tell you I translated it to English so that people should understand what it's all about. And for 50 years, I couldn't find this little booklet I want you to know. I knew I had it. Well, not 50, but we've been living in, in this house now for 12 years, and I've searched for it several times. Couldn't figure out where I put it. Mesha. Volt egyszer egy kislány, kicsi mint egy mákszem. Új hazát keresett, és nagy mezőben állt meg. Kis szívét kitárta, jó kedvet árasztott, kapott érte menten új szülő istápot. De nem tartott soká az édes bús élet, mert a régi házban minden újra élet. Fájó volt a vállás, mert a kis barisnya az új szülők szívét magával batyuszta. Azért, ha néha itt lapozol ágikám, Gondolj majd jó szívvel a Gyula bácsira. And this is written October 8th, 1948. Um, I read this at the end of my interview in Hungary with the press, uh, because in that little booklet that the ambassador dress uh, spoke of me, they mentioned that I came all the way from America just for this ceremony and so they were all interested in me and I read that. Now uh, since I'm home I gave a little talk at our temple Emmanuel in Roanoke at the rabbi's request and so I translated this into English and if it doesn't rhyme you'll forgive me. I did as well as I could. Once there was a little girl smaller than a colonel landed on our doorstep, leaving the inferno. We became her parents. With her, we shared our home. Did not wish to leave her to danger all alone. 
She filled our lives with sunshine and opened up her heart. She earned our instant love. We wished she'd never part. Our bittersweet existence did come to abrupt end when old home and parents for her did later send. Our goodbyes were painful once we had to part. She bundled up and took her newfound parents' heart. Through the years, dear Agnes, should you come upon these lines, think of us, please, fondly, and know you touched our lives. So I meant something to them, too, and they meant, of course, a great deal to me. And I am glad that they did get the Award of the Righteous. I just really wish that they had been alive to accept it. Is there something else that you would like to add in, in closing or any, any lesson that you feel all of us could impart? I hate to use the word lesson because the Holocaust is not there to instruct us. It was a, a something in history that should not have happened, of course. But when you look back on all of this, what else can you take from it that might be of use to us in this day and age? Well, I can tell you how it affected me overall. I will never deny my religion. I don't care what happens in this country. I will always be a Jew. Nothing of that sort could ever humble me to the point of feeling afraid. But I wonder how on earth things like this could have taken place. I cannot understand it. There were other incidents of brutality. I remember very, very well reading a book by Franz Werfel um, where the Armenians and the Turks had similar situations occurring. And then we have Bosnia and we have this and we have Arab and Israeli conflict and everybody fighting everybody. But the brutality and the magnitude and the efficiency with which they carried all this out secretly because nobody believed this mass murder is really possible is totally unbelievably astounding. And I don't know what the lesson could be. I just don't know. Maybe one should have a little bit more uh, togetherness in one's uh, feelings uh, of protection of others. I, I have no answer, I'm afraid. I just hope that with having children and grandchildren that history will not repeat itself for them. Thank you very much. Agnes Heller. Thank you.